Wow. That was timed. That was pretty cool. Good job. Everyone cheer for Ryan. Yeah, Ryan! And Matt. And Matt! All right. How is everyone? Wonderful. Hi. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Okay, well, before I get started, I want to share a couple verses. Um, talking about being more than conquerors through Christ. So it's a little long, so if you need to, like, close your eyes, think about it. Go ahead. All right. I didn't screenshot the reference. I think it's Romans 8, 31. Uh, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a powerful passage. So let's stand and sing and celebrate the fact that we are more than conquerors through Christ. Hope and strength is gone. You're the one who calls me on. You are the life, you are the fight that's in my soul. When I'm on. All right, let's try that again. When my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on. You are the life, you are the fight that's in my soul to your throne Sing. we are more than conquerors to Christ you have overcome this world this life we will not bow to sin or to shame we are defiant in your name you are the fire that cannot be tamed you are the power in our veins our lord our god our conqueror yeah. sing into the night Christ is risen and on high greater is he living in me and in the world no surrender no surrender no retreat we are free and we're redeemed we will declare all the despair you are the
sing, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious. Nothing, oh, nothing is impossible. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. Oh, you are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious. Nothing is impossible. Sing it out. Oh, nothing is impossible. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are greater than our hearts. You are stronger than the dark with you. We are victorious. We are more than conquerors through Christ.
father's house. In my father's house, there's a place for God, we thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you. It is because of your, the blood of your son that we can be called your children. And only through your son, through the grace of Jesus. God, I pray tonight that you bring clarity to where we can find our identity. And that is only in you. God, I pray over Tyler and everyone in this room that you would speak to our hearts. In your name, amen. All right, give it up for Ellie. Thank you, Ellie. All right, we're so, we're so glad that you've joined us. We got people with popcorn, with chips, uh, just like good audience. But we're so glad that you're here. Uh, if you are here for the first time, which I don't see any new people besides my sister in Kataika, we just give them a welcome. All the way from Philadelphia. Well, technically Venezuela and Chile. But they're here from Philadelphia, and they're going to be visiting, this, visiting us this weekend, so make sure you make them feel welcome. Uh, but we're so glad that you're here. It's so good to see you. faces that I haven't seen before uh, and people that I get to see every week. Uh, we're, we're so glad that you are here. So let me, have, uh, let me tell you what's going to happen. I am not going to be speaking uh, tonight. Uh, I have a special guest with us. We have Tyler, who's one of the youth pastors here at church, who's going to uh, bring God's word with us. But... But just want to remind you that tonight we're wrapping up our series called Asking for Our Friends. And I don't know about you, but for me it's been so refreshing getting to study and getting to talk about certain topics that, that are really awkward and sometimes uncomfortable to kind of ask out loud. And that's why we call this series Asking for a Friend, because there are certain things, there are certain issues and sins or, or just patterns of behaviors or orientations that we struggle with but we are too afraid to be like, hey, Johnny, we should talk about this. Or, hey, we should talk about that. So that's what we, do, we did this series. So I would love, uh, I know that we are finishing this series here tonight. But I'd love to continue this series next year again and maybe do a part two. When maybe you can get to talk about certain topics that you are struggling with. All right. So um, tonight we're going to talk about what if my friend is struggling with uh, his or her identity. So what if my friend is struggling with his or her identity. So I'm going to invite my friend Tyler to come up, come up, uh, give him a nice warm welcome, the point welcome. Uh, he's going to bring us word to us in a power aid. <laughs> that one's for me, unfortunately, but sponsor. Um, so first of all, this is, this is going to start to sound like a flex. I promise it's not, and it will be made very clear why it's not. But if you see me, like, standing very awkwardly, it's because my arms are super sore, and I can, like, barely stretch them out. I did work out. The reason that's not a flex is because that's the first time I've worked out in, like, four months. So, <laughs> and it was on Monday that I worked out, and today is Thursday. So, not a flex whatsoever, but just so you're wondering if I'm just, like really getting into my lesson, but I can't explain. Yeah, anyways, so we're going to start with a little game, just to, you know, start a little fun. That's all I really do as a youth pastor is just play a bunch of games. So um, this is Kahoot. If you're not familiar with it, go ahead and just type in Kahoot into your browser. Safari, Chrome, Firefox, whatever you, you rock with. Um, yes. Ah. You don't have your phone? Oh, you cannot play. No. Mmm. No. Yes. So if you go to Kahoot and then the game pin 3667570, it's a very special number to me. So 3667570. We did a Kahoot with the high schoolers on Sunday, and I wanted to. Flex, nice. Very, I want to um, applaud you guys because you've already had far more names that are appropriate than them. So last time I do Kahoot with teenagers. All right, I'll give you, I know that's not actually Ciara, 
you silly goose. So I'll give you seven, I'll give you 10 seconds. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Does anybody want to play but has not gotten their name in? Nobody? Anybody? All right, so what this is, I'll explain it before we start it, but this is going to be basically a quiz for how well you know me and my wife. This is my wife, Ciara. If you don't know her, meet her. She's pretty great. Um, so yes, that is what we will be doing. Go ahead, start it. It's not Tyler versus Ciara. It's like Tyler and. I forgot to change it. Oh, well. Yeah. So first question. Who binge watches anime? There was some really bopping music that Kahoot offered, but we don't have it. So we're rocking without it. I could beatbox, I suppose, but that's not going to happen. It was Ciara, indeed. That would be true. I'm not. I did watch Hunter Hunter. Ciara's in first place. Shocker. So it's not actually. Who has been a Christian longer? Ooh. Who has been a Christian longer? A believer, a professor of Jesus? Ciara. Back to back Ciara. And Ciara, the fake Ciara is still in first place. Third question. Who has seen all nine seasons of One Tree Hill? If you don't know what One Tree Hill is. It's a pretty wonderful teen drama. Of course. So this is the, the culture of Tyler coming in. One Tree Hill. Who has more tattoos? Tattoos. Who's tougher, basically? Ciara, by far. Not even close. I have zero. Ciara has seven? Four, that's pretty close. They're both single digit numbers. Five of eight. Who has fell for a credit card scam over the phone? I know it says feel, but it's supposed to say fell. I'm not good at spelling. But who fell for a credit card scam over the phone? Yeah, right. Six of eight, six of eight. Who rejected who before we started dating? Did Ciara reject Tyler or did Tyler <laughs> reject Ciara? Absolutely not. Never. Look at the two of us. That was obvious. That was almost a freebie right there. All right, these last two are true false questions. I believe the first one's about me. Tyler once cried because he saw a hawk kill a squirrel. Is that true or false? True or false? This is after my one, one Tree Hill fan night? Yeah, false. You guys don't know me at all. Don't know me at all. Thinking I would reject this wonderful woman? Crazy. Ciara has never been in a fight. Hmm. This is the tattoo girl we're talking about. Keep that in mind. <laughs> We'll consider that a spoiler because she has never been in a fight. Did you get a single question right? You got a lot of, a lot of grunts back there. All right, M, who's M? Congratulate Emily, well done. And then Amanda, and we already know who this is. It's not actually Ciara, let me clarify. We have a jokester in the audience apparently. Sweet. Well, well done, Ciara. You know us very well. All right, that's all I got for a game. Now it's time to get into the sermon. So yeah, so like Johnny said, this is the last installment, correct, Johnny? Last installment of asking for a friend. So here I am. Oh, all right. Well, in that case. Um, but 
The reason I started off with this wonderful, fun game, outside of the fact that that is my only job as a youth pastor is to do fun games, is that um, I wanted to talk a little bit about just differences. So me and Ciara, we're pretty different people, but together, we make a good team. Um, I was saying to people earlier, Ciara is smart, she's funny, she's compassionate, she's loving, and I am married to her. So we make a really good combine. That's kind of a joke, but all right, that's fine. <laughs> They're all like, yeah, that's, that's basically it, bud. Um, no, but me and Ciara, we're pretty different. We're different people, as per some of the, the questions would indicate. Um, but larger than that, uh, men and women are very different people, very different in a lot of ways. So there's some, so I have a, I have a list of some, and I have, I have sources for each one of these in case you want to argue with me, but don't do that. So the first one is a very simple physical, well, there's obvious physical differences, but women have better immune systems than men do. Did any of you know this? Did any of you know this? Well, now you do. I apologize to you then. Um, and that comes from the Journal of Clinical Investigation. Sounds pretty legit if you ask me. Um, now, men, let's, you know, we got some stuff going for us too. We have better spatial reasoning. So while women don't get sick and don't die, we can find a way around a supermarket kind of thing. So, sweet. So, it, however, now we're, we're on to some of the neurological differences. Women have better memories. So they can remember things. They cannot die, but we can navigate a city, like I said. And I promise sources, that's from the National Center for Biotechnology Information. That's pretty legit. I don't know how to get much more legit than that. But... On a more spiritual level, go ahead, flip over to Genesis as I kind of tee this up for us. Men and women are different. They're distinctly different. There's a lot of reasons there's different. There's some of these simple reasons that we brought up. But we're going to see the, the very start of uh, men and women being brought into this world and the purpose behind that. Why did God not just create one gender and then we, some, I don't know how we'd reproduce, but... Why not? Why not? And we're going to look at that. So Genesis 2, I'm the worst at giving out chapters when I give away books of the Bible. But Genesis 2, Genesis 2, verse 18, it says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man, referring to Adam, to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the, pla the, pl the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. So outside of this surgical procedure, what we see here is Adam has a need. It talks about Adam, uh, it's not good for man to be alone. Adam, it, what I would infer from that is Adam was probably lonely. Yes, he has dominion over all of the all of creation of the wild animals the birds in the sky all of the vegetation all of fruit anything that he could eat he had all of this but he was still there was still something missing out of that they were looking for a suitable helper so what i infer from this is that god made women and god made men distinctly to complement one another like there's, again, bringing it back to my relationship with my wife. Ciara would probably be pretty nervous to be up here speaking tonight. Would that be fair to say? Do you, I'm just kidding. That's good. I would suck at her job. I would be terrible at her job. I, I would never get hired for that job. But if someone ever did make the mistake of hiring me as an administration assistant, I would, 
the company would do terribly. But we have these distinct differences, and we have these specific roles that God gives us the opportunity to have based off of our gender. And because of the gender that each of you have, the gender that I have, God has given you distinct advantages because of your gender. What, like we talked about, some of the simple differences or some of the larger differences. But with this topic of gender, and specifically male and female, begs the question of sexuality. You know, it's a very, um, it's a very pressing topic nowadays, especially within Christian circles and how they relate with people outside of Christian circles, how people view Christianity, how Christians view outward comes this question of sexuality. So that's what we're going to look at. And the way that I want to approach this is I want to clear up a lot of misconceptions uh, that either the Christian community has or people have about the Christian community when it comes to sexuality. And how I'm going to phrase that is just going through some hypothetical situations because I'm a very practical guy. Like we can talk theory and theology all day, but I want to know how is this applicable to me. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through a bunch of different scenarios that you either have faced before or maybe you're afraid to face because you don't know how to handle them. But hopefully after tonight, we'll have some misconceptions cleared up as well as be prepared for potential conversations. Does that sound good? Okay, awesome. Thank you. So first situation, a Christian is talking to a guy. So you're sitting you're listening to this conversation. A Christian is talking to a guy who is gay, and he is explaining to them that being attracted to other guys is a sin. And you're on the outside of this conversation. You're listening to it. How would you enter into that conversation? If you were part of that conversation, what would you contribute? Would you correct what he said? Would you affirm what this person said? How would you handle that situation? The first thing, as I break down this situation, is... It's really important to have concrete definitions when you have conversations with people. And now, while you may disagree with the definitions that I'm about to say, the only reason I say them is not to like force my definitions on you, but just so when I use these words, you know what I'm referring to. Does that make sense? Okay. So first thing is attraction. That's what they're talking about, right? This guy is telling this person like, hey, this attraction that you have is sinful. How I would define attraction is the simple acknowledgement that somebody or something is good looking. It is appealing to you because of the looks. That is as simple and also complete of a definition as when I use the word attraction, that is what I mean. Make sense? Okay. The next definition is lust, okay? Because that's obviously something heterosexual, homosexual, lust is all over the Bible, and sexual immorality, all of that is all over the Bible. We should be familiar with it. How I would define lust is taking attraction and seeking sexual gratification from it. Now, this could be all mental. Of course, this could be physical and how you're acting out with this person, um, but even mentally, right? Um, so the first point I want to make is that when I look at Scripture— and I, of course, I'm a, well, I'm not very humble, but I try to be. And in this area, I, I'm humble enough to admit that maybe I don't know everything about it. But when I've looked in scripture, when I prepared for this lesson, when I've looked at other points in my life, I don't see anything in scripture that would indicate to me that when I met Ciara for the first time, and I was like, wow, she's very beautiful. She has very beautiful eyes, that that would be a sin for me to think that. Therefore, when a man meets another man and thinks, wow, he has very pretty eyes and ha there's an attraction there, I don't see how that would be equal to sin either. So that's the first point that I wanted to um, address. However, and more importantly, again, this is all sexual identity. This isn't just homosexuality, heterosexuality, but when the attraction, like we talked about, defining attraction and lust, when I meet Ciara and I notice how beautiful her eyes are, when I start to appreciate other features, obviously we're getting to a place that is sinful, right? Because I'm taking this attraction and I'm bringing it to a place where I am seeking sexual gratification from the attraction. 
So there's a difference. And then this is obviously the same for heterosexual, homosexual. So the first misconception, the first scenario I wanted to break down was this lie that attraction is a sin. Everybody with me? Awesome. So the next situation is you are talking to, who are we talking to? Someone who's gay. Again, we have a lot of gay friends. And they know that you're a Christian. They know that you're a Christian, and they know that a lot of Christians have this idea that, like, homosexuality is a sin, right? So this person says to you, with this information in mind, that um, they're like, so you're a Christian, they clarify all of these things, and they say, I didn't choose to be gay, right? I have always had this attraction, I've always had this idea in my head, this is who I have been forever, and your God created me, the God that you believe in created me to be this way, and now that he's created me to be this way, you're telling me that how I am, how I've been born to be is sinful, and I'm going to go to hell for it. I could never believe in a God like that. Some of you may know people with this opinion. You may have struggled with this opinion yourself, but it's, how would you, again, think of that situation. Someone's coming at you very aggressively, I would say, but they're angry, they're upset, and this is the opinion that they have, and they say this to you. How would you respond to that? Flip over to James, and we'll see what James has to say about it. When I, um, it's crazy how fast things change over the course of like months, but years. When I was in high school, this was probably the most um, popular objection that I would hear about kind of this clash in communities between Christian communities and LGBTQ plus communities would be this topic right here. It's like, God, James 1, did I say the chapter? James 1, I got it for you now. Um, is this idea that your God created me to be this way and now he's telling me that I can't be it. That's, that's the objection we're dealing with here. That's, again, a misconception, but we'll talk about that. So James 1.13 it says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Now, I'm going to use an example here. And I will be the first to admit and make sure you hear this when I say it, and you don't just like tune in halfway, and you're like, that's a terrible example. I know this isn't a great example, but it communicates a principle that we're going to touch about this overarching um, theme here. So if you don't know a lot of my story, I'm not going to get super into it tonight, because we just have so much great stuff to get into. But when I was in high school, well, when I was in middle school, I kind of went to church and stuff, and I like got serious about it a little bit. But once I got into high school, I started partying, things like that. I wasn't really a part of church. I knew I wasn't a Christian at the, well, I actually, anyways, I'm not going to tell my whole testimony, but partier, that's what you need to know for what we're talking about today. This temptation, and now, of course, I'm a, a disciple of Jesus, and I do not do those things anymore, but for me to come up here and be like, it doesn't even tempt me to go out to the bars with my friends. It doesn't even tempt me when my friends are watching the Iowa game, and they're getting drunk to not partake. For me to say those things don't tempt me is, would be a lie. They're super tempting. They're super, it still seems appealing. It's sin. Sin is tempting. Sin is enticing. And I use this example, this temptation that I still carry. I'm quite certain it could change, but I, I don't think that temptation will ever leave. I think I'll, I will always have that temptation in my life to, to go do these things. Now, for me to conclude from that, that God has made me designed me to be particularly susceptible to this sin is not fair, right? There's a number of reasons why I have that temptation in my life. And I would say that's the same thing for all sin that we would talk about. Um, but James makes it very clear that God cannot tempt us with evil. So when we talk about this idea that God created me this way, and now he's telling me that I can't be this way, whatever the sin may be, whatever the topic may be, is a misconception. It's a lie. So in this conversation, when someone's really passionate and saying, your God created me to be this, and now I can't be that, 
we see here in James, clear as day, is not true. It's a lie. God didn't create us to be, and this is really, when we talk about the theme of identity tonight, this is like crucial. First of all, if somebody is talking about this, like God created me to be this person, well, your sexuality isn't your identity. That's not who, that's not where your identity starts, and that's certainly not where your identity finishes. That's an aspect of who you are, and sure, it may be an important aspect to you. However, to say that that is the person that God created you to be is another misconception that leads you into thinking that certain aspects of your per personality is your identity. This can be true for a number of things. This can be true for your job. You know, God created me to be an engineer. Well, God gave you a lot of gifts that maybe fit well with being an engineer, but for you to say that you are an engineer and God created you to be an engineer is a misconception of how God created you to just be a gifted and smart and talented person, period, regardless of your job. Understand the, the principle I'm getting across here? Perfect. So, again, I know with my drunkenness example, there's holes in that. I get it. There's holes in the job comparison. I get it. But the principle remains that God didn't create us to be somebody that he would later condemn. There's a number of reasons why that could exist, and James touches on that too. But we had a bunch of other situations to get to. So next up, you're talking to a Christian, and they say being gay isn't a sin. And you say, okay, what do you mean by that? Because I've heard a lot of people who profess Christianity say this. And maybe some of you in this room would say this. And then... They say that to you. You say, what do you mean by that? And they say, well, if a man wants to marry a man and a woman wants to marry a woman, like, what's the big deal? It doesn't matter. How would you respond to that? Would you flip to scripture? Would you affirm that? Would you deny that? For tonight's sake, we're going to flip over to Romans 1 with the chapter and everything. Romans 1. <clears throat> I would say, out of all of the hot topics or pressing issues, whatever you would want to call it, in the church today, this is probably the one that is under the most scrutiny, under the most debate, um, and I think that will only become more and more uh, present in our, in our churches. A lot of division, a lot of people branching away, but what we do, the church that we're at right now, we strictly believe what the Bible has to say, and I would hope that that would be your conviction as well, that when we form convictions about these things, we go to God's word. So Romans 1. Romans 1, I'll be in verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up for their dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relationships with men, obviously, for those that are contrary to nature. And the men, likewise, gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So obviously, the scripture is talking about homosexuality, specifically practicing homosexuality. And what I want to identify at the end of the scripture, two main areas that kind of um, sum up the, the, the sentences before it. It says, receiving in them the due penalty for their error. So it refers to homosexuality as an error. And because of that, there will be a due penalty for it. Okay? Go ahead, flip over to 1 Timothy. Because I think 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 1. Because I think 1 Timothy does a good job uh, with the rhetoric that it uses um, when we're developing this theology. Now, for some of you, because like I said, this is a an issue that is um, a lot of people are dividing over. So I'm sure there's people in here that are probably struggling at this point in the lesson uh, with this theology. And you have two options. Is when we look at scriptures, they can make you upset, which is totally fine. The scripture invokes a lot of emotions out of me. But the conclusion that you draw, you can you have the free right if you want to leave here and be like you know what i heard what tyler said i heard what the bible has to say but i don't believe that homosexuality is a sin i don't believe this or that that's totally your decision however you also have to accept at that point that you're not accepting christianity you're not accepting the bible you're not accepting what jesus had to say you're making your own religion branching off of the things in the Bible. Does that principle make sense? I know maybe it doesn't make all of you happy, but 
That's what it is. So 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. I mean, that is only two of multiple examples. And the reason I, I read these is not to single out a specific sin, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but is to make it clear to you guys that Scripture is clear on this issue. And I like what it talks about, obviously, homosexuality, what we're talking about tonight. Number, in verse 10, practicing homosexuality. What we talked about, this idea of attraction, and we're going to get to some more misconceptions that will really hopefully refine um, your theology in this area. But this idea that taking attraction, turning it into lust, practicing is very different than how somebody identifies using kind of the lingo that people use, but what I would consider attraction, okay? So there's a, it's very crucial there, but scripture is super clear, and I get that maybe that is damaging for some of you who have friends who are gay, that's damaging for some of you who are struggling with this sin now in your own hearts. I know that that's difficult to, to accept, but at the end of the day, all of us, are going to have moments like this where we have sin in our life and we have to repent from it. That's the gospel. Jesus goes around telling people, Paul goes around telling people, all these evangelists go around telling people to repent, you know, and this is part of that process. So another misconception is the idea that um, homosexuality isn't a sin. And maybe that's not present in this room, but I promise you it is elsewhere. And maybe it is here as well, but obviously needs to be addressed. So the next one. One of your gay friends finally comes to church. All right, sweet. Jim's coming to church. So Jim comes to church, right? And he comes up and he meets me. And he's like, oh, how's it going? We're talking, whatever. And he's like, all right, let's just cut to the chase. Like the elephant in the room, right? I'm gay. I'm at church. Like, what's the deal here? Like, I know that you guys kind of have these thoughts about it. Explain this to me. And I tell him, you know what, Jim? Is that why I said his name was? Jim? Jim. You know what, Jim? If you want to become a Christian, you have to marry a woman. That's the reality of the situation. And you're like, Tyler, what the heck, man? Jim's never come back to church. So Jim leaves and he's mad. But how, if you witness that conversation, if you're a part of that conversation, again, think about how would you enter into it? I want this to be a very applicable, practical lesson um, outside of the fact that Tyler sucks at his job. But go ahead, flip over to 1 Corinthians 7. And again, I don't know how uh, prevalent this particular misconception is um, now, but I used to hear this a lot um, from a variety of people outside of the church, was this idea that if you become a Christian, you have to marry a woman. You have to enter into like a heterosexual marriage, because that's what the Bible commands. Okay, well, we'll see about that. So 1 Corinthians 7, I hope you're there, because I'm just going to get started. I wish, so this is Paul talking. Keep in mind, Paul is a single man. This is Paul talking. He says, I wish that all of you were as I am, referring to his singleness, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. It's always hard to find a good time to take a drink, but I'm really thirsty. So Paul is literally encouraging people to stay unmarried in this scripture. And again, this theme of identity tonight. Yeah, we're talking about this, uh, the topic of homosexuality and stuff like that. But I hope that, we, I hope that you'll understand that there's a lot more at play here. Because my goodness, do I think Christians do a bad job of glorifying marriage above singleness. Marriage is to be glorified for sure. But singleness, especially in the context of Paul, Paul's saying, I wish all of you were single. Understand what he's saying in this. That's literally what he's saying. We have that completely backwards. 
at least that's my perspective. That's how I see it. I see a lot of people rushing to get engaged, rushing to be married, and there just seems to be this unnecessary burden and stress that this is the successful life. And I don't know if that's society, but I think it's particularly Christian culture. And wow, does Paul just say like, that is so untrue. So yes, we're talking about homosexuality, but this idea of identity. Your identity is not found in your marital status or your dating status or your Facebook relationship status, whatever the case is. That, that is so far from your identity. Again, yes, it's an aspect of who you are, but these things don't make up your identity. Your identity is found in Christ. Marriage is not a command, and being single can certainly be glorified, as Paul demonstrates here. Um, I have no idea how long I've been talking, so I'll try to wrap up here. But that a total misconception that if somehow you were to convert, identify as, as gay, being attracted to people as the same sex as you, that you would have to enter, you would have to enter into a marriage to someone you weren't attracted to, and yeah, that's just so unbiblical for homosexual, for heterosexual. This idea that you have to be married could not be further from the truth. But I promise I get going. So there also seems to be this again, just a terrible job by the church is that this idea that homosexuality is somehow worse than other sins. We talk, or at least the perception that I know almost every single person who's not a Christian has is that that's like the worst sin. Is like they just hate homosexuals. Have you guys ever heard that before? Is that people think that Christians hate gay people. And I just, it, sickens me that that's the case. I don't know why, I don't know what's happened over the last couple of generations, or I don't know how long this has happened, but that certainly seems to be the case right now, is that there's just this huge divide that people are so intimidated within this community to even come to church because of this, and that it saddens me. Because Romans specifically says that all have sinned. All of us have sinned, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And I guarantee my sin is a lot deeper than a lot of the people's in this room's sin. But still, we are all equally. Another scripture is that if you have fallen in one area of the law, you are guilty of all of it. So this idea that somehow homosexuality is any worse than lying, is any worse, and this is crucial, any worse than heterosexual sin, is completely not true. And this leads me to my last point about how am I supposed to have, <clears throat> or what is my relationship supposed to look like with people who are gay? My question is, why, why is that any different than your friends who party or your friends who just aren't Christians at all? They're lost. Why would you treat that person any differently because they're gay? I get the question. It makes sense. But again, the, the reason that that question is asked is because there's this odd emphasis that I just, I don't understand why there's such this emphasis on like homosexuality being this like greater, like this greater or worse or somehow different sin than the rest of it. I don't understand why it exists, but since it does exist, my answer to that problem is treat them just like you would all of your other non-Christian friends. Be a great example, love them deeply. You know, I, I was talking to one of our high schoolers the other day, and I was just so encouraged because I, you rarely hear this from a teenager, but he said to me, he was like, the reason I've enjoyed coming to Nexus is because I just feel so loved here. And I was like, that is so awesome because that is not the case for a lot of people, particularly a lot of people within this community. We have to love people deeply regardless of the sin that they're struggling with. And I am not at all, I'm, if you know me, you know I'm the last person that's going to suggest condoning sin or allowing that to, to stay prevalent when people are trying to seek God. But this idea that you would treat them any different than your other non-Christian friends is a misconception, plainly, since we're talking about misconceptions today. Um, I'll just wrap up there. Um, I'll pray. Hopefully there will be a good opportunity in small group. But what I encourage you guys and I just am super passionate about this, is if you have a difference in opinion, 
or if you're, obviously, of course, if this is something you're struggling with, just please be honest in your small groups. There's so, I see so many people who go through kind of the church routine, and it's just so superficial, and there's no vulnerability, there's no honesty, and this, there's, it really just, we are wasting our time at that point if we're not being open and, and helping one another in these areas. So just whatever the topic is, wherever your small group naturally goes, I just encourage you all uh, with every topic, yes, but again, with this topic that, again, for some reason is just heightened more than others, please just be honest with each other. You know, that's what we're here for. We're here to be vulnerable and honest and just help one another. So I might have talked for an hour. I literally have no idea, but I'm going to pray now. So it's over. So it's good. Um, God, your uh, word is encouraging and your word is also at the same time convicting and it's uncomfortable and it's controversial and it's hurtful at times um, to, to be called out in different areas. And I know that there is probably so many, even with a group of 30 to 35 people, there are so many different struggles in this room. There are so many different opinions in this room. But God, the one ask that I have of you, and I just ask it sincerely and humbly, God, is that you would just elevate your word above anything else that's in our hearts, whether it is a temptation, whether it's an ideology, whether it's an opinion, Lord, just allow your word to cut so deeply in our hearts that nothing else would trump it. Nothing else would matter more than what you have to say uh, about this topic and about any topic, God. Because as we talk about identity, Lord, you are the start and the end of all of our identity. You are the end-all, be-all, and we don't live for ourselves, but we live for you and through you because of your spirit. Um, and that just couldn't be more prevalent with a topic like this, Lord. We love you so much, and I just I ask and I, I beg that you would work in our hearts in this way uh, and just let your, your scripture and your word be heard. Praise things in Jesus' name. Amen.